Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving us such a warm welcome. My name is Tim Fines. I'm at the BBC, and these are my colleagues, Catherine and Neil from Ipsos. Uh, we've been collaborating on a piece of work looking at virtual reality, which we're delighted to share with you today. We're personally really excited about this, and we think it's an area which is of crucial interest for the industry to understand as interest booms in it. In a moment, we will walk you through what we did, but first, I'm going to provide you with a little bit of context. Um, so, by show of hands, who in the audience has had an opportunity to try a piece of virtual reality content in a headset? Wow, that's quite, quite a few of you. Brilliant. Um, so, as many of you will know, the quality of VR experiences can vary dramatically. Uh, we have seen audiences be fantastically frustrated by the often poor user experience you can see across various headsets, and indeed sometimes even physically nauseated by having content which hasn't been produced properly. However, on the other hand, uh, we have seen audiences be utterly inspired and delighted as they are transported to and immersed in entirely new worlds. Oh, click through... So there's a whole range of different pieces of content out there which you can experience. These are just a few screenshots of some of the things we've, we've been looking at. Um, so you can experience what it's like to be a fireman, uh, walk with dinosaurs with David Attenborough as your personal guide, start to understand what it's like to lose your eyesight, and even more profoundly, begin to appreciate what it might be like to be a Syrian refugee crossing the Mediterranean in a smuggler's boat. So it's for these sorts of reasons that we at the BBC and at Ipsos believe that virtual reality could have real potential in helping to tell new stories in really impactful ways and ultimately for us help deliver our public service mission of informing, educating and entertaining. But for those of you who haven't tried VR before, we wanted to give you just a quick snapshot of what it's like. This is a trailer of a piece of content we commissioned last year based on Tim Peake's mission to the International Space Station. So it's a truly stunning experience once you do it, and if you have a chance, really highly recommend it. Um, it's a bit like being Sandra Bullock in Gravity, but slightly less terrifying. Um, but as you can see, virtual reality has the real power to take you to places where you would otherwise not be able to go. I think only about 250 people have ever done a spacewalk, and obviously far many more people can do that. So for the BBC, virtual reality opens up whole new impactful ways of telling stories. And for Ipsos, VR also gives opportunities around getting closer to consumers, testing new products and services in virtual environments, and also, as we're doing here, unpicking how audiences interact with new pieces of content and technology. Work from Oxford, Stanford, and uh, UCL here in London has, done, has gone some way in substantiating what the impact of virtual reality can be on audiences. We know that it supercharges emotion, it can drive memorability, engender empathy, aid learning, and indeed change attitudes and behavior. There was a study which Stanford did a short time ago where participants were asked to try a virtual reality experience where they were going to be chopping down trees. Sometime later in the day, a member of the research team accidentally on purpose knocked, down, knocked over a cup, of, a cup of water, and those participants who had tried the experience used 20% fewer paper napkins to mop that water up, we think is a direct result of wanting to conserve trees having had that experience. So that's 
obviously only one experiment, but an interesting example of the potential real-world applications which VR could have in having positive social outcomes. Now, uh, so our excitement has been mirrored very much in the white industry as well. Some of these numbers you'll be familiar with. So last year, $2.3 billion was reportedly invested in virtual reality uh, uh, areas in mergers and acquisitions. 150 million headsets reported to be in use by 2020. And over $12 billion to be spent on an annual basis by consumers on VR entertainment and hardware. So those are some pretty he heady numbers. But let's be clear, audience usage is a long way from what those numbers would suggest right now. We think that between 1 and 5% of the audience have access to a VR headset. And it's probably e even less than that. So whilst the creative opportunities afforded by virtual reality are evidently immense, it doesn't really matter that much if not, pe not that many people are going to be actually using it. And in the meantime, we risk making content which doesn't really hit the spot in environments which don't particularly work and potentially turn off audiences before they've had a chance to really get excited by it. So for the BBC, having pioneered new forms of storytelling since 1922 across radio, TV and online, we want to help the rest of the industry develop really great experiences for our audiences. So we hope the, sh uh, the work we're going to go through today goes some way to helping do that and to form the new grammar of storytelling which we need to develop to create those experiences and the new rules around user experience and discovery which we have to look at. So we share this work today in the same spirit as we do at the BBC. We have a commitment to our audiences tattooed across our chests. They really are the heart of what we do. And so today you will hear some things which are potentially familiar, some things surprising, but hopefully all useful stimulus in creating great VR experiences. So on that basis, I will hand you over to Catherine. Thanks, Tim. So we wanted to ask ourselves as insight and marketing professionals, what do people really make of virtual reality? Do they like it? Do they want it? Um, do we really know these things? And I think, as Tim's kind of got to, there's a lot of enthusiasm from the BBC in terms of creating great VR content. There's a lot of enthusiasm at Ipsos in terms of what purpose it could have for research, what kind of content our clients are going to create. But it felt like our collective enthusiasm wasn't necessarily backed up by a real understanding of how mainstream audiences experience virtual reality. Now, I think it's very important to point out here that user analytics are a really powerful way to understand the user experience, but they definitely have their limitations. So this study was very much about getting under the skin of virtual reality. What do people feel when they experience it? How does it fit into their lives? What type of content really appeals to them? So it's very much about exploring the challenges and the opportunities that virtual reality provides. Um, so if I introduce you to our audience, we took eight adults and eight teenagers, all had some interest in virtual reality but hadn't tried an awful lot of it. Um, and we gave them a Samsung Gear 2 headset for two weeks and asked them to try it out. The first week was very much about free exploration, just seeing what happened, seeing what they found. And the second week was about us serving content, which we thought was quite good quality to see how they, um, they felt about that. Um, so it's very much, it's worth pointing out that this study is about the in-home virtual reality experience so there's lots of other places that it has applications but this was about how does it work in the in-home environment so let's introduce you to our mainstream um, so um, we're going to start at ground zero really um, what did they think about virtual reality before they'd experienced it headsets <laughs> 3d blocky sort of idea freedom that that it gives you to go forward from what you are experiencing. I feel like it's like, like Narnia, you know, like you walk through the little wardrobe and <laughs> it's like a new, that's what I hope it's like. I'm gonna be disappointed if it's not that. And obviously the PlayStation VR is very gamey focused because it's a PlayStation VR. Um, so I think I was expecting it to be very game driven. Uh, and uh, yeah, and also I wasn't sure, coming from the Google, Google Cardboard, because that runs Android, that was quite, I thought it was quite blurry 
Mm. And it wasn't very, com- wasn't very comfortable. I think as a mum, I don't know how much I'd use it though. But it, it, and it was also really strange when you see other people doing it. Yeah. And, you know, like they're seeing things that you're not seeing, mm. and they look really weird <laughs> doing it. Um, but it is. It's very cool. I don't. I don't. No, I don't really know that much about it. So, but it's kind of hard to. I haven't because I've never done it. It's kind of hard to kind of know what it is. So you see there, they're not really sure what to expect. They think it's this new shiny technology, maybe associated a bit with gaming. Um, they're not quite sure if they've tried cardboard before, especially about what the quality is going to be like. And there's general sort of concerns about nausea, about feeling isolated, and about looking a little bit silly. Um, but they are really excited about it. They think it's this new technology. They want to give it a try. They've heard it's a bit cool. So we didn't want to hold them back. Um, we let we gave them a headset and let them get on with it. Oh, there's a doggy. Does a dog move? He's just moving. <laughs> oh no! No! Oh my God! Oh, that man, get out! Oh my! <laughs> oh my God, it's right by my face! Oh my God! Oh my God, it's gonna hit me! Oh my God, okay. I'm on a roller coaster. <laughs> oh look, I can go down. Oh my gosh, I've got an arm! Oh, I've got legs! They're really skinny. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so fun. I feel so immersed in it. Like, like I'm, I'm even getting like the sensations of like butterflies. Oh, well. <laughs> that is... That is quite something. That was really cool. I don't want to be back in normal reality now. <laughs> So it's quite a good news story. I think the good news is that people really get virtual reality when they actually experience it. And there's some quite positive emotions and excitement coming there. They're out there. They really, really like it. Um, and those kind of quite initial low expectations are far outstripped when they start to understand the quality and the nature of the experience of virtual reality. But I think we do have to be mindful of the marketing challenges that there are in terms of accurately describing what virtual reality is to somebody who's never experienced it. And this is particularly pertinent because of the wide variety of technology which determines the nature and the quality of the experience that you have. Um, quite interestingly, um, the experiences that they initially are drawn to um, tend to be those that get their blood pumping. So they're the horror experiences, they're the extreme experiences. And quite honestly, they have a lot of novelty factor. What they're not doing on their own is seeking and finding all the variety of content that's out there available to them. However, when we do serve them the right content, there is potential to go, through, to go beyond this um, novelty factor. Um, and we found that VR is particularly well attuned to certain themes or types of content. Um, to start with empathy, um, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes is something that really, people really found quite profound. Um, doing something you wouldn't normally do, having an adventure, going skydiving, that kind of thing. Um, we also found it was particularly helpful for learning because you're immersed in that experience and you understand exactly what's going on. We'll see some video on that in a moment. Um, but also for relaxation, um, for switching off, for getting away from distractions, from feeling genuinely immersed. Um, and the type of content that we served them here that really, really worked was the content that they couldn't find anywhere else on any other medium. It was quite unique to virtual reality, and it felt like it had real-world impact. I think it can be very profound. I think... Um it's a, it's a different way of experiencing something. You don't have to you don't have to um, go for all the trouble and having to experience it in real life. You can just put it on, put on a headset and experience it. When you think of VR, you don't think of well, I don't anyway. I think of oh, there'll be all these thought provoking, interesting sort of. I thought it'd be quite throwaway content of like oh, you know, although fun like that one, the facial fears one. It's fun, but it's not, it's not going to 
change the world. Groundbreaking is a weird word to use, but there's like some really interesting and like immersive experiences that you can't get watching the telly or, you know, on your phone. I think the whole idea of an alternate sort of dimension and a completely different world from this one also piqued this interest. I made this alternate world in my comic that's underground and uh, it was an early thought but I think it, this, this whole virtual reality thing motivated it quite a, quite a bit. But the biggest benefit for this is that I'm, I'm watching this and I'm not doing anything else and then the sense of scale. So for example the David Attenborough thing where he says I could talk about how long 50 feet is but here it is and the, the thing walks past you and it takes a particular period of time to walk past you. Okay, now I get how long 50 feet is. I can visualise that. The skydiving one was good. Um, I've, I've always wanted to do skydiving when I'm older. I just felt really, like, pumped. Like, I want to do this when I'm older. If that's what people was experiencing firsthand, I want to do it. You feel like travelling through it, you know, you kind of understand more the blood going through the veins and everything, rather than just knowing that blood passes through here. So we've always seen the antibodies come in, and that's pretty cool. So that's something I never really thought of, and it just led to better understanding. I kind of started to think it was a bit more impressive than I initially thought it was. Um, and even though it has, it has its issues, but um, I do think it could actually do a lot more good um, than just being an entertainment platform. So an awful lot of potential here for virtual reality if content is particularly well thought out. And this obviously has great impact for people like the BBC in terms of producing public service content. But beyond that, for anyone who's producing virtual reality content, for content creators, for brands, um, thinking about the type of content that will really give you that return on investment, given actually the penetration of virtual reality is quite low at the moment. Um, so high quality content does have this amazing potential but to be quite blunt about it there's not an awful lot of it out there from what our participants were, ser were searching out and it's not quite enough for participants to think I'm going to continuously put my VR headset on um, and that's not necessarily surprising because obviously as an industry we're still exploring, we're still working out what virtual reality content works and we haven't yet created a VR grammar in terms of the exact things about content that will, that will appeal. So we pulled out a few things that might help with this. Um, storytelling um, was definitely not a given in terms of a lot of the content that our participants explored but it is absolutely crucial and often not thought about. Um, and well thought out content is, it is the ones that really, really engage. So there's a piece of content called Notes on Blindness, which has a really well crafted narrative that goes alongside a really interesting visual immersive experience. We think that gaming works quite well in this um, in this arena partly because it has quite a clear objective and giving your piece of content a clear objective is, is absolutely vital. Um, there's a lot of potential to play around with scale and it works really well here. So you saw the body VR where you shrink to a cellular level. Um, a guy in the video talking about that. The dinosaurs, a true sized dinosaur walking past you. And in part this is just quite cool. Um, but it also aids your understanding and your learning process which I think is really important. Presence and embodiment is really important um, to consider. You really need to feel like you're there. You need to feel immersed. And there's a great piece of content by Cirque du Soleil where the actors are all around you. Um, and one of the things that made you feel present in that moment was they were making eye contact with you. And that really worked quite well. But producers need to be really careful not to cognitively overload people. Um, people need time and they need space to process what's happening in virtual reality, particularly at the start of the experience. And they need to know when and where to draw their attention because on a 360 degree scale, you may be looking at something that's less interesting, but something very interesting is happening behind you. In short, they need to be guided through the experience. So lots of really great opportunities to create great virtual reality content, but there are some challenges. And I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Neil, now, who's going to talk you through them in a bit more detail. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, so the story so far, it's one of um, initial excitement, of good first experiences, of content that resonates, other content has impact. 
Uh, and this sort of stuff that really works has kind of added value. It's unique to VR. Um, but there are some uh, challenges, if I can get this thing to work. Um, and I'm going to go through three that we found out um, from the research. Um, and we think it's important because we want to balance it with thinking about the potential of VR. We need to also think about the challenges. So the first one is discovery and the user experience. The second is um, hardware limitations. And the third is uh, usage occasions. So let me start with uh, discovery. So it's not actually obvious that people are going to find good content. So there's good content out there, but it's not obvious that they're going to get to where the good content is. So our participants actually struggled to find good content. They're actually fumbling and bumbling around in the first uh, week. So they spent a lot of their time uh, in the Oculus app, in YouTube, um, and you know, they came across a lot of like, content they thought was games-oriented. It was fairly gimmicky. It was fairly low quality, um, especially with the 360 uh, YouTube content. Um, so it shouldn't come as a surprise then that when we asked participants what they've been watching, uh, they couldn't really tell us. So attribution was difficult. So they don't really know what they're doing, where the experiences are coming from, or who's actually serving them um, the experiences. So for us, um, audiences need to be able to find content related to their needs much easier. Um, they also need to know what to expect from experiences what certain destinations will offer them, and this is going to help uh, attribution. So they also need to be exposed, uh, when you think about it, uh, to content they wouldn't automatically choose. So they need to expand their range of tastes so they know what's out there. Uh, and there's a role here for uh, content uh, curation. You know, tr from trusted brands, curation that takes into account audience needs, their usage occasions, with the goal of expanding it beyond that novelty uh, horror type experience. Um, this kind of sounds straightforward. Uh, on the one hand, you think, okay, we'll iron out the user experience. But when you give it a bit more thought, it's actually not that easy. Uh, the VR environment at the moment is fairly fragmented. There's diff the mobile uh, environment. There's different hardware providers, different user experiences. And it's actually not obvious that this is going to automatically get ironed out. So let's consider hardware. So the mobile experience has like definitive, definite limitations. And I think some of us, uh, myself included, are in danger of confusing sort of Bentley hopes with Morris Minor realities. And we sort of need to come down to earth a little bit. Now it's quite a clear picture of the beach, so that's good. Oh, uh, but now, oh God, it's frozen. Yeah, my, my gear VR needs to cool down. It is a big, big problem because, one, it kind of puts me off from using it because I'm like, well, there's no point because I'll probably have to turn it off, like, it'll just turn off. Um, and also, yeah, it just totally takes you out of the moment, <laughs> which is such a shame. It's so annoying. So there's two main issues we saw with kind of hardware practical limitations. Uh, one uh, is handsets tend to overheat after 30 minutes. Uh, participants ran into a lot of trouble here. And this is frustrating. You want to have a good experience, but your handset overheats, just like in the video. Second was Wi-Fi. So participants had like, various types of Wi-Fi quality, which led to uh, variable content resolutions. So in other words, they were experiencing low-quality resolution content, especially on YouTube, as a result of their Wi-Fi. So I mean, from a, from a user experience, uh, I mean, the key point is that these frustrations are going to limit how VR is used. Um, so from the audience perspective, if you think about it, so they don't really care if it's the hardware or the software or anything in between which causes a glitch. All they kind of care about is they want to have a good experience and there's something wrong with that. And, you know, that's quite frustrating. So, I mean, from an industry perspective, we need to be cognizant of the... Um, the, the practical limitations, but also we need to be aware of how real people are using it or not using it uh, in real life contexts. So to come back to my slightly tortured uh, example, we need to build experiences uh, with the Morris Minor engine in mind, not the Bentley. So usage occasions. So most people actually don't have a Bentley, but they do have um, busy lives. Uh, and actually virtual reality, while we might think it's awesome and it's a central sort of thing, actually it's fairly peripheral to people's lives, so I'll let the participants talk for a bit. I can use it, I just don't feel 
the need to use it. Because I have been busy and, you know, moving jobs. There was certainly one, like, Sunday, Sunday afternoon, um, kind of didn't really have much to do. So then I was like, okay, I'm just going to have a mess around on it. Pass it to my boyfriend and he had a go. And um, that was cool. I liked that. I would buy one, but I'd only use it, like, every weekend. It wouldn't fit in as much as, say, my phone would or PlayStation or something. But I personally want sort of stimulation. I want mental stim stimulation. But if, say, I, someone wants to calm down after a very busy day and they're surrounded by a mess, they, they, want, to, they want to calm down, they can just put a virtual reality because it closes them off from everything else. So just to continue on from the video, I just want to consider the quote here. So it's Alexis ultimately saying, VR's a bit of a faff, you've got to get this headset out and plug it in, uh, and if you compare it to the TV, you know, there's a bit of effort involved. So I'm going to come back to this point in a minute, but I just want to tell you about uh, three kind of conclusions uh, around occasions. So the first, I've already alluded to it, um, VR's actually a ca an occasional activity for people. They use it sort of in their downtime, maybe in the evenings, maybe on a weekend. Actually, they're not jumping out of bed to use this stuff. It's like a now and again sort of activity. So second, usage occasions. So they're actually fairly short-ish, so about 20 to 30 minutes. People are not spending hours in virtual reality. It's fairly short. Suggests a real limit to virtual reality experiences. Um, and then finally, so people actually view virtual reality as an individual experience. So for them, it's all about sitting down, getting everything out, and kind of zoning in or zoning out to an experience. Um, so it's quite an individual thing, although there's some so, sort of novelty um, experiences shared with friends. Like if you bring a headset to a party, that's kind of quite fun. But again, fairly gimmicky. So what explains this? Well, related to the quote, this is high effort stuff. If you think about the stuff we usually do on our phones, tablets, TVs, whatever it is, it's fairly automatic, easy, seamless. With a headset, it's a bit of a faff, um, and participants realize that. So second, what we found is that the content that actually really resonates is like high value content. So it's stuff that's occasional uh, appointment viewing. So to go through all the effort of, of getting out your headset, has, the content has to be worth it and good content helps people get over those barriers. Um, and the third one's quite a funny one, uh, social factors, quite important. So we found people being quite concerned about makeup smudging, about hair being wrecked, about looking uh, silly in front of friends, and actually just feeling a bit weird using it by themselves. So social factors are going to limit uh, usage occasions. So to conclude on this point, um, how VR sort of integrates into our, really, our real lives is of fundamental importance. We need to concentrate on making seamless experiences that integrate into real people's lives and we'll make better content and VR experiences because of it. Okay, so that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Tim to wrap up. Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Neil. So, to be honest, we've been pretty blown away by the sheer volume of really rich insight which has been coming out of just two weeks of ethnography. And what we've shared with you today only really scratches the surface of what we found. But at the same time, we know that there is a hell of a lot more that we need to do to better understand what makes a good experience. But for now, let's recap some of what Catherine and Neil have told us today. So we know VR in-home entertainment is going to get bigger. More headsets will be sold, more content will be made, and consumers will undoubtedly find stuff which they love and appreciate. But when thinking about putting the audience first, we think there are five key things which the industry needs to consider to ensure that VR can reach its full potential. The first is around customer expectations and associations of VR, which, as we mentioned, are varied and not always accurate. So this is a key marketing challenge. Second, issues around discovery. We know that our audiences found it really difficult to find good content, and often the stuff they found was not very good at all. And so that served to turn them off. We need better curation, and we need to be able to match good content to audience needs. Third, the user experience is fantastically clunky at the moment, providing yet another barrier to mainstream adoption and creating a habit. Similarly, hardware. Lots of difficulties here, as Neil laid out, around Wi-Fi download speeds, headsets overheating, batteries running out, that sort of thing. 
And then finally, we don't have a great understanding yet of the sorts of occasions which a VR is going to be used for, what's going to really get an audience member to go through the faff of getting their headset out and meeting a need through virtual reality content. So some of you will be familiar with this kind of chart, hype cycle of tech adoption. Now, we know that it is not guaranteed that all technology will reach the mainstream. Think of th things like the 3D TV as a good example of that. So we think in-home VR entertainment is somewhere in the middle there on the slope of enlightenment. But there is every possibility that it could enter into another trough of disillusionment if we don't deal with those issues as laid out in the previous slide. So... Coming out of that, we think there are two key calls to action for the industry. First, we need to simplify. We need consistency across what is a very fragmented hardware and software experience. This will help content creators like the BBC create more content at better quality, but crucially help audiences navigate a wide range of different environments. And second, we need to put the audience and not just the technology at the center of the experience. This will help us better understand perceptions and associations of VR, but also the needs and occasions, which ultimately will help us make content which resonates more, audiences can enjoy, and has impact. So if there are two things to take away from today, it's really around that point around simplicity and also putting the audience at the center of the experience and the design of virtual reality. Now, as I said earlier, the BBC has been pioneering new forms of storytelling since 1922 across radio, TV, and online. And we want to help the rest of the industry take advantage of the storytelling opportunities which virtual reality presents. For us, this study really underlines the opportunity that virtual reality has for us to more effectively inform, educate, and entertain all UK uh, license fee payers. Um, happily, the BBC and, Virtual, um, and Ipsos Mori are continuing our research partnership over the next year. We're going to be taking a longitudinal journey with the, these very same participants to better understand how virtual reality fits into their lives, the sort of media habits which they uh, begin to have, and unpicking that question of what VR content really does resonate and have impact. So maybe we'll be back here next year to share the next phase of that with you. But in the meantime, thank you very much for your time, and we'd be delighted to take any questions you might have. Thank you.